Hi, my name is Mitch Jackson and I would like to welcome you to TrialLawyerExpert.tv. In this video, I'm going to share with you several techniques that I've effectively been able to use to either neutralize or make a particular point with opposing counsel's expert witness. I hope you find these tips and, and these approaches useful in your next trial. I'd like to take you back in time to my client's home. You're sitting on their couch in their living room and they've just called the police department to help transport their adult son who's having some medical issues to the emergency room. The doorbell rings and three police officers arrive. You welcome them into your home. Eight minutes later, your adult son is dead. This is a case that I tried several years ago, and it was a case with allegations of three police officers using excessive force against my client and against my client's son, which resulted in his death. What we're going to talk about in this video today is a technique I use to cross-examine the defendant's expert witness uh, regarding issues of excessive force. Now, in our case, the plaintiffs argued that the three police officers, without cause and, and without any level of justification, improperly placed their son in a carotid chokehold, a blood choke, where the police officers come up from behind and they'll, they'll grab the uh, suspect or the victim's throat in their arms right here, wrestled him to the ground, and that resulted in his heart stop beating, it resulted in a lock, lack of oxygen to his brain, and it resulted in his death. The defendants contended that they did nothing wrong and that their conduct throughout the course of the evening, specifically for three or four minutes, and that's, that's the window of time we're talking about, was reasonable and necessary under the circumstances. Now, those are the general facts of the case that we're trying in front of a jury of 12 here in, uh, have to be in Riverside, California. What we're going to focus on has to do with uh, dealing with the other side's expert witness. In this case, we had an expert witness who was offering testimony as to uh, whether or not the three police officers engaged in excessive use of force. Uh, there were other experts in the case with respect to cause of death, uh, with respect to some other issues, but right now I want to focus on the defendant's police expert and the excessive use of force issues. Now each case is different, and in this particular case, their expert was very well qualified. I wasn't going to spend my time trying to show that he didn't know what he was talking about with respect to his area of expertise. Uh, he was an expert in police conduct, police training, and excessive use of force issues, so I wasn't going to uh, try to take him on in front of the jury with respect to showing he wasn't an expert in his, in his particular field. As a matter of fact, he was, and he was very good and very impressive. What we did instead is I wanted to show the jury that everything this expert relied upon was provided to him by defense counsel or by representatives of the defense counsel. And when you really think about it, expert witnesses retained by the other side are in, in many instances only provided with information by the other attorney. That's often the case. Information an expert witness testifies to. Something that he's looked at, documents, records, reports, photographs that he or she has looked at has been provided to him by opposing counsel. Sure, there's some situations where the experts independently done test, the experts independently researched an issue or fact, but for purposes of this video, it's just a situation where the information provided to the expert was provided by defense counsel. When defense counsel was done with his expert witness on direct examination, what I then did is, is I stood and talked to their expert and I believe I followed up with some of the issues 
uh, that he testified to towards the end of his direct examination. Asked a few questions, developed just a little bit of rapport, and then what I did is I, because this expert relied upon, uh, when he made his expert opinion on all the information that was provided to him by defense counsel, I went through the list. For example, I talked to him about the report that uh, he rendered his excessive use of force opinion on. Where did he get that report? And well, it was from the defense attorney. Did he have any involvement with the preparation of that report? Well, he didn't. It was an investigative report prepared by police officers uh, four or five years earlier. Uh, same question with respect to an autopsy report. Was he involved in the preparation of that autopsy report? Was he present during the autopsy? And obviously, this expert's response was, no, I wasn't, no, I wasn't. Same thing regarding photographs, same thing regarding other items. I just wanted the jury to know that this expert's opinion was based upon documents, items, and things provided to him by the defense attorney. Okay? His opinion was not based upon independent research or independent results by this expert or people in this expert's office. Okay, after going through the documents, after going through uh, the items that this expert testified on direct, that he relied upon in, in formulating his expert opinion, once we got through that list, I then roll over to ask questions as to whether or not this expert ever interviewed any of the witnesses who were present on the night of the incident uh, concerning what they did or didn't see. Now, I already knew the answer to this question. I happen to know he didn't contact the two or three family members that were present on the night of the incident. He didn't ask them what their version of the facts uh, were. He also testified during his direct examination that he didn't speak to any of the police officers present on the scene later on that evening as to what they did or didn't see. So we went through the names of, of the four or five material witnesses who were present that night and I got the expert to confirm that no, he had never personally spoken with Mr. So-and-so. He had never uh, sat down and did a recorded statement or a handwritten statement with Mrs. So-and-so. Okay, so now in front of the jury, we've got a witness sitting there that's doing a good job, but the facts that he based his expert opinions on were not based upon any research that he did. It's not based upon any independent document preparation that he did. It was based upon what documents he reviewed. And it certainly wasn't based upon him independently speaking with any of the percipient witnesses present on the scene that evening, whether it be for the plaintiffs or for the defendants. Now, having laid that foundation, and here, here's the important part, this is what we're getting to. You lay that in foundation and then you ask the following series of questions. The first question, you ask the expert and you ask him very clearly. You take your time and you want the jury to hear every word that you say. And your question is, Mr. Jones, would you agree that the opinion you just shared with the jury earlier today is only as accurate as the facts that you base that opinion on? Listen to the question. I've yet to have an expert respond to that question with anything other than an unequivocal yes. The expert is going to look at the jury, he's going to look at you, and she's going to look at you and say, yes, the, the opinion that I shared with the jury earlier today uh, is as accurate or premised upon the facts and information provided to me. So the first question you ask the expert is, would you agree that the opinion you just shared with our jury is only as accurate as the facts that you based that opinion on? That's your first question. Okay, once you get that question and answer out of the way, you follow up with a second question. And the question I like to ask is, and would you agree, Mr. Jones, that if the facts that you base your opinion on, the opinion you shared earlier with this jury concerning excessive force, if those facts are wrong, isn't it true that that might indeed affect the accuracy of your, of your opinion? It's a powerful question. I don't really care what the expert 
says, once again, it doesn't really matter how the expert responds to you. They're going to feel like they were presented with the accurate facts. So I've yet to have an expert answer anything other than yes. If you provide me with inaccurate facts, and that would in some, some way affect the opinion or my expert opinion on this case. So the second question, once again, is something like, would you agree that if the facts and information you were provided is inaccurate or wrong, might that affect the validity or accuracy of your expert opinion? When you ask that question, you're looking at the jury and looking back at the expert because you know he's going to say yes. If he answers no, the jury's going to be rolling their eyes and going, okay, we've got somebody here that's more interested in saying what he's paid to say as opposed to what he really believes. In many instances, at this point, you can see by looking at the expert's body language that, that he knows and understands he's being led down a certain path. And it's not a path that he wants to go, go down, but he can't avoid going down this path. So he's going to answer that question, yes. Okay, now you can come back to show the jury that the information he based his, his opinion on uh, was simply provided to him by the defense attorney or representatives of the defense attorney. So once again, rephrasing your question is just a little bit different so you can get around the asked and answered objection, which, which you should expect. Briefly talk about with the expert and confirm in front of the jury so, so that I understand it. And the question's like this, so that I understand it, your opinion, the expert opinion you shared earlier today concerning excessive use of force was premised upon the police report provided to you by defense counsel, yes or no? The autopsy report provided to you by defense counsel, yes or no? And a summary of witness statements of police officers once again provided to you by defense counsel. Is that a fair statement? Now most experts will agree, yes, that's the information I provided or I relied upon in formulating my expert opinion. Some will also offer, plus my 20 years of experience testifying as an expert witness. Now think about it for a second. That really doesn't help the expert. It actually shows that he's, he's nothing more than a professional expert witness. But having said that, follow up with a brief overview of the documents that he or she relied upon in formulating his or her expert opinion. Okay, now what's just happened is you've just shared with your jury the fact that this expert has testified as to his or her opinion simply based upon information provided to him by the defense attorney. So now you're going to turn things around just a little bit. In California, this expert's not allowed to sit in court and listen to what the other witnesses during trial have said. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask the, the expert to instead interpret the facts of the case as presented by witnesses for the plaintiff. We're going to force this expert to render an expert opinion based upon the facts if they were viewed or slanted in the plaintiff's favor. Now, one way to do this is to ask the expert at this point in the cross-examination, Mr. Jones, do something for me. In this case, it's the plaintiff's position, and remember, the jury's heard all this. Uh, Mr. Jones, in this case, witness Bob, witness Sam, witness Julie, for example, all testified that when the police officers came into their living room that night, that they did nothing wrong and their adult son did nothing wrong. As a matter of fact, without provocation, without any reason whatsoever, Officer Jones stepped around behind the decedent while he was standing and without warning, with, uh, without any reason whatsoever, placed him, reached around and placed him in a carotid uh, restraint or a blood choke, held him like that for about 20 to 30 seconds while two other police officers jumped on top of this man, wrestled him to the ground, one placed his knee into the back of the decedent while the other two officers handcuffed him and handcuffed his ankles. Let's assume just for a minute 
that those are the accurate facts. Not the facts provided to you by defense counsel, but the facts provided by the other parties in this case, the Smith family. Having shared those facts with you, do you feel, based upon those facts, assuming those are the accurate facts, do you feel that the conduct of the police officers under that set of facts, assuming that they're true and accurate, would have constituted the use of excessive force? And it's a yes or no question. You may have to break this question down in, in, into smaller parts, but I'm trying to make a point. And I did this in a trial, and the expert witness he said and responded something to the effect, if the facts are as you just described them to me, then yes, that would constitute an excessive use of force by the police officers. Now, if memory serves me correctly, that's it. I sat down. I got the expert to admit that if, in fact, the facts as presented by my clients were the accurate and truthful facts, then the police officers acted with excessive use of force. When he responded to the question in that fashion with a yes, yes, that would have been an excessive use of force. I looked over at the jury. I looked back at the expert. And I thanked him for his testimony. No further questions at this time and sat back down. After the trial, the jurors let us know that the cross-examination of this particular expert witness was one of the reasons they completely discounted the defendant's side of the story. And instead, for many, many reasons, and many of the right reasons, found in favor of my client's family. So, in summary, when you have a situation where the experts relied upon information provided to him from the other side. Emphasize that to the jury. Let them know and confirm with that expert during your cross that all the information he's gotten was from the other side. And then once you've done that, ask the questions as follows. Would you agree with me, Mr. Jones, that the opinion you just shared with this jury is no more accurate than the facts that you based it on? Okay, that's your first question. Your follow-up question is, and if the facts that you based your expert opinion on were either inaccurate or not true, would you agree with me that that would affect the validity of the expert opinion you shared earlier today? It's a yes or no question, and they're going to answer yes. You've made your point. You've, you've completely neutralized this expert for purposes of these particular issues at time of trial. There are other things you also want to do when cross-examining an expert witness. It has to do with who retained him or her, who's paying him or her, and things along those lines. And I'm going to share these things with you in another video. So if you found this video useful, please share it with other lawyers you know who are trying cases. This approach works very well, and as I indicated, the jury found it as being a persuasive part of the trial that allowed them to rule in my client's favor and come back with a multi-million dollar verdict in favor of my clients. So that's it for today's video. If you found this video useful, please feel free to share it with other lawyers who are trying cases. Also, please feel free to go to my website. It's www.triallawyerexpert.tv and get on my email list and I'll send you updates when new videos are coming out along with some other trial tips that, that I'll share just by email. And also make sure to get on our blog feed. It's the RSS feed so that whenever there's an update to the website, you will also get a short note in your email inbox letting you know there's been an update to the website. You don't have to keep coming back to the website. It'll just let you know. You click on a link and boom, there's the new video. I'd also like you to join me on the various social media sites. Join me on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google+. The links are all next to the video here on the website. And I'm using social media on a daily basis. 
I'd love to connect with you and exchange trial tips and other information uh, with you. So please join me on social media. Until the next video, that's about it. My name's Mitch Jackson. This is TrialLawyerExpert.tv, and I'd like you to remember to always make today your masterpiece.